came. I love a song from Will I Am and the script. It gives me that oomph. Yeah, puts me in the mood for personality profile every Thursday here on Joy 99.7 FM. You're most welcome. My name is Lexus Bill, and I'm excited, of course, not just because it's a regular Thursday, but because I've got an amazing brother in the studio today as my guest on Personality Profile. You'll be amazed at the wealth of talent that I have in here. The next hour, you need to be stuck on this dial. If there's somebody you you out there that you feel needs inspiration to make it in this life, you might want to tell them to tune into Joy FM right now because they might just love this conversation that we're about to have. Yeah. My guest tonight is probably the most sought-after contemporary artist in Ghana. Yeah, he's an author and an artist of monumental ins- ins- installations. Yeah? Now, he started his practice through his interest in the history of materials and architecture. His work has included objects from jute sacks and used to transport charcoal and those things, you know, sewn together and superimposed on architecture. And it's amazing. You need to look it up when we're done with this. Now, his work has been included in the 56, 57, and 58 Venice Biennale, Documenta 14, Athens, and Cassel as well. Hope I'm getting it right. Images, an age of our own making. Denmark, the island is where the sea surrounds, Valletta 18, Malta, labor of many at the Novel Foundation, Cape Town, Parliament of Goods at the Whitworth Art Gallery in Manchester, and currently at the 22nd Sydney Biennale. Yeah. So our first president, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, built some silos in parts of the country for storing millets, cocoa, and other products for export. Now, most of these silos were left hanging after he was overthrown. My guest bought one of these silos in Tamale for about half a million dollars and converted it into a museum. Yeah. <laughs> now, you'd get to understand all of this tonight as we get to know him more. Now, in a what somebody will call a demoralizing ecosystem where artists have to swim all by themselves offshore, my guest has been and is trying to change the narrative. He founded the Savannah Center for Contemporary Art, the Red Clay Studios as well. And he is still poised to develop art in this country. Ibrahim Mahama <laughs> is my guest here on Personality Profile. Welcome, brother. How are you doing? <coughs> I'm very well. Thank you. <laughs> nice. Really happy to have you in here. I know you're very busy. You just landed in Ghana, what, hours ago? <laughs> and I've been able to, you know, get you into the studio. I'm, I'm really lucky, am I not? <laughs> <laughs> it's an honor for me to be here, honestly. So yeah. so, I, so I, I hear you were in Amsterdam. Were yes. you doing an exhibition? What was this trip about? Uh, well, um, I was working with some colleagues on a project in uh, Vienna, okay. in uh, Austria, uh, actually eight weeks ago when mm. I left Ghana and uh, afterwards I had some ex- exhibition projects you know because of the coronavirus mm-hmm. a lot of things were stuck for a while yeah so now that Europe has been opened up everyone suddenly wants to be able to realize their projects so yeah. there were a couple of there were about 15 projects which I had hanging wow which were all happening at the same time wow so for eight weeks I had to be traveling in between countries uh, yeah working on those good stuff i mean we'll get into the nitty-gritties yeah. of it but for starters i'm sure uh, you you probably have had this a, a lot of the times where people will say oh are you the founder <laughs> of engineers and planners and you're like no i'm an artist <laughs> i'm not ibrahim Mahama. oh wait are you related to the former president john mahama uh, are you no. <laughs> <laughs> not in any way <laughs> okay so you are not the ibrahim mahama the engineer and planner? No, I'm not. Not yeah. at all. I'm and just you... Ibrahim Mahama, an artist. Okay. Yeah. But you get that a lot, eh? Quite a lot. Yeah. Ah. Even some articles I haven't written over the years have somehow always confused both. Okay. Ibrahim Mahama is not just an engineer, blah, 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 but he's also an artist. And then they, oh, they, they show pictures of my work <laughs> under his. <laughs> okay. So... Uh, like you mentioned, you, you, you travel a lot. How's your schedule like? What do you do? Because I, I know you're based in Ghana. Yeah. And it's quite surprising as well because for an artist who's hosting exhibitions in all over the world, uh, how come you're able to still come back to Ghana? And what's the schedule like? How are you able to put it all together? Well, um, the work that I do, um, 
I have to travel in order to work, to do some projects sometimes, in order to be able to raise the capital I need mm. actually to do the work that I do here in Ghana, both either in Accra, Kumasi, or in Tampali, where I'm based. Um, recently, when I traveled, so generally when I travel, I just don't go to one place. I go to multiple places because okay. sometimes I also go to teach. So recently when I went to Vienna, I was uh, I left Accra to Paris, to Amsterdam, then went to Vienna. Then from Vienna, I went to Italy, to the city where I had an exhibition. Then I went to Venice to see the architecture biennial. Then to Milan because I had a meeting towards a project next uh, later this year. Then I went to um, a place called uh, Central Fies mm. to go and teach for a day. Then I went to <laughs> Bolzano because I'll be teaching there. Then went to uh, Innsbruck. And this is all by train. So I went to Innsbruck uh, mm -hmm. for a day and then went took a hike up the mountain with some friends. Then the next day I took a bus from Innsbruck to Berlin, 11 hours. But, you know, when you're in Ghana, like going from Accra to Tamale by bus and all, you have all those trainings. So me, I don't mind sitting in a bus for like 20 hours. Yeah. So go to Berlin, have some, uh, uh, do, I had a lecture to give and also some meetings towards projects in Ghana. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm also, I also just don't concentrate on going abroad to do exhibitions. I also look for people to work with who will come to Ghana to actually host important projects here. Okay. So then from Berlin, I took a train to Düsseldorf, then to Amsterdam then went for this exhibition, then then took a flight back to Vienna, then Amsterdam, then I took a flight to Madrid, then from Madrid to Paris. I, I'm dizzy. It's okay. Yeah, I'm, so I'm that's, dizzy, like, so like. that's <laughs> the... <laughs> so it's, 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 it's really complicated. Yeah. Uh, and as an artist, when one thinks of you, maybe they just think that, oh, he's in a studio painting, mm -hmm. but it's also about how you connect to spaces. Yeah. That matters. And, and, and here, you have a few things on your hands. Yeah. I'd want you to tell us exactly what, because I know about the... Savannah Center for Contemporary yes. Art, uh, the Red Clay Studios, mm -hmm. and uh, oh, what do you call that? The Nkrumah Volley. Volley. Yeah, <laughs> Volley. Nkrumah Volley. Yeah? Yeah, Volley. Okay, yeah. What, what exactly are they? Yeah, so um, SCCA, which is the Savannah Center for Contemporary Art, is, uh, uh, you might say it's a modern contemporary art institution. Mm -hmm. So in art, we have modern art, which comes from a certain era, from the 20th century. And contemporary art basically comes from like the late 20th century, so from 1970s onwards, from conceptual art and all that. So in Ghana, we have uh, a lot of artists, older artists who've practiced, done very significant work uh, over the last uh, six, seven decades. Mm -hmm. But because the state is not really proactive, we've not really invested a lot into cultural institutions because even if you see our National Museum, it's been, it was stalled since Nkrumah's overthrow since 1966 a lot hasn't been done actually in developing the rest of the museum so you have a lot of these artists who've done really significant work but in terms of the younger generation connecting to that there's very little of that so when I, I had a, an idea to build a studio in Tamale in 2014 when I started earning money for my work <coughs> so a year later I decided oh, why not convert it into like an art institution where we can actually focus on older artists works and practice so I dedicated that space actually to retrospectives. And retrospective basically means that, for instance, Lexis Bill is an artist or an architect. He's worked for 50, 70 years. But how do we bring his life's work together so another generation can be able to look at his work and appreciate the significance? Then it can also have an impact on their lives and their work. Wow. So that's what the Savannah Center does. Mm -hmm. So we also have a library there. And we focus most of our exhibition programs on school kids. So okay. we do a lot of workshops. Red Clay is another site. It's more raw. It's in the rural part of Tamale, just a bit outside of Tamale. And uh, it's a studio, basically an artist studio. Mm -hmm. But what, does, what happens within an artist studio? Is an artist studio a place where the artist goes to produce artworks or okay. to produce objects for the market, like where we sell works mm -hmm. like internationally? But I always say that, no, the studio is not just for making work. The studio could be a place where radical ideas can be born, or it could be a place where we could actually uh, ask ourselves certain questions. We take time to reflect. So um, <coughs> in the studio, we have uh, we host exhibitions. Mm -hmm. uh, the plan is to be able to host residencies. Uh, there are cinema spaces within the studio. There are library spaces. Uh, we have six airplanes, which I bought from Accra and, com and transported to Tamale, which we've turned into classrooms, so we teach kids <laughs> in them. Uh, you, you and many other things. <laughs> uh, Pause on. 
like not paper planes yeah actual planes aeroplanes aeroplanes <laughs> and you you dragged them to tamale yes and parked them at the red clay studios yes. to be classrooms yes why <laughs> yeah just to stretch the imagination of uh, <coughs> the younger generation and particularly in tamale because i was born in tamale mm -hmm. of course but i was raised in accra but um since i completed uh, uni in 2000 and i finished my undergrad in 2010 went back to do the mfa which the masters finished in 2013 and around 14 i decided i was going to do this go back to tamale <coughs> because a lot of people grew up in accra live here and their whole world is centered around this place because capital accumulates here here you can find opportunities and all that mm -hmm. but my question is always that with very with the little opportunities that we get sometimes it's also important that we take risk and we go back to places where it almost seems hopeless or there is nothing and then through that maybe we can actually invest or plant seeds which will germinate which would uh, grow into like bigger trees and yeah. things like that so yeah so i thought tamale would be brilliant because the community in janachang that's the community where the red clay studio is it's just um, a normal village Mm. place farming community but suddenly with the studio there with the airplanes and all that it transforms actually the mindsets of the people who live there particularly the children mm. imagine you're a child living in a village somewhere and you have an institution like this which becomes part of your narrative because ordinarily a lot of these kids would have never seen airplanes because they a lot of people aspire to do things that they are if my father is a farmer and I live in a rural community where even because when I built this studio there, there was not even water in the village. There was no electricity and I had to pay for all those amenities to actually to be taken there. So at the end of the day, <coughs> now it has actually transformed, not just in terms of like the artistic transformation, but there's also social transformation, transformation yeah. within the space. So art does a lot more than just yeah. someone looking at it from afar and saying that, oh, that's a good painting. Yeah. It's not about a good painting. It's about the... It's about the how uh, the subjects uh, relate actually to what the artist, the artist's idea or what the artist makes. That's where the point is. Yeah. So I try to stretch art within that context. How much did it cost you to buy those six airplanes? Well, buying... They were, were they decommissioned? They were decommissioned airplanes, but three of them were actually still functioning. Okay. Yeah. And what, you decided to take out the engine? Um, well... <laughs> Yeah, <coughs> well, um, there there were uh, there were uh, three Starbo airplanes and those Starbo Starbo. Okay. So those ones, there were two jet airplanes. Four, they you know Starbo had these uh, big jet planes. Yeah, four engines. Yeah. So I had two of them. One of them was packed in Tamale. You remember, some years ago there was a Starbo that was landing in Tamale and the nose, the landing nose broke. Yeah. So that was in Tamale for many years. Okay. So I acquired that one. There was a doctor in. Um, uh, Kumasi, who had acquired it for projects, but he left it. So I negotiated with him and I took it from him. The ones that were in Accra, they were owned by different people. Uh, the Starbo was owned by one Hajia in Kumasi, mm -hmm. and the other Starbo was still in the name of the company. They sold the inner parts of the airplane to a company in South Africa. They came to Ghana with containers and they took everything out the seats, everything, and they were going to scrap the shell. And I told them that, no, don't scrap the shell. I want it because it's really beautiful, the shell in yeah, itself. Because yeah. unlike the other airplanes, this time you can see the internal organs of mm -hmm. the airplane. So I saved that one. That was the least expensive of those. That was like 6000 at the time when I acquired it. Because it was just a sh Yeah, okay. just a shell. But uh, the first one I acquired was 30 The other one was 30 uh, there was one which was fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, thirty thousand okay. dollars. Right. Yeah. So in all, the, it was a hundred and ten thousand to okay. acquire, okay. but to dismantle, to because I had to uh, work with the Ghana Police Service to pay them for escorts to Tamale okay. trucks. We needed special types of trucks, uh, particularly some of the trucks that had been used in transporting the beams mm -hmm. for the circle interchange. Yeah. They could extend, blah blah blah. At the end of the day, I spent roughly two hundred and fifty thousand to get them to the site okay. reassembling and everything wow yeah interesting we'll get we'll get mm. to talk more about these sites but i am particularly interested in your story yeah where you were born how did you grow up um, 
uh, share a bit of that with us. Yeah, so I come from a polygamous family. So uh, growing up, I had many mothers. How um, many? <laughs> four. You had four mothers? <laughs> yeah, four mothers. Okay. Yeah. So How many siblings? Uh, biological, 10 siblings, but in terms of the extended family, quite a lot. And um, I don't, in the society that we grew up with, I don't think you can reduce your family just down to the biological. So in terms of siblings, I grew up with countless number of siblings. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, sometimes your siblings who are not even biological sometimes tend to be a bit more useful and helpful generally in life, you know. So I'm very much interested in that. That has really helped shape me a lot. Okay. I grew up in Accra. I w was born in Tamale, but I grew up in Accra. So I went to various schools from Anse Preparatory to Vichans. I went to a boarding school in Insawam, Prince Boating. Okay. Um, at the age of five, I was taken to a boarding school. Uh, ah. Yeah, St. John's Preparatory. <laughs> yeah, till I was 12. I was there with my sister, mm -hmm. my older sister, Nafisa. And then um, she went to a, or she went on to a Brie Girls, and I, they took me to a school not far from here, uh, Star Avenue. It doesn't okay. exist anymore. So um, then from there, I went to Pope John Senior High School. Um, Pujuba. Pujuba. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I was there for three years. I did visual arts, mm -hmm. and uh, that was really good. It was the f it was my formative years as yeah. a person, as an artist. I always tell people that I don't think I have teenage years because when I went to secondary school, that was the time I really decided that I wanted to do this with my life. Mm. At the time, I used to, yeah, I used to find street artists, people who were painters, who I thought were interesting, and I used to go to their studios, sit by them to see what techniques they were using, things like that. So I invested a lot of time into that. You know, most times when people are young, they think, oh, there is time. Yeah. You know, but for me, when I was between the age of 14 and 18, I realized that there was quite a lot to learn within that period. So I did that. And then afterwards, I went to uh, tech. Okay. KNU Hold on there. Um, let's talk about the growing up bit yeah. in a polygamous home yeah. with four mothers. Yeah. Your, your, your father had four yeah. wives. How was that and how did that shape you? Did that? Do you think you missed something? No, I don't think so. Mm. For me, for the better part of my life, as a young child, I spent it in between boarding school and coming home mm. and also traveling to the north to be with the family, learn more about the family. And because I grew up in a home where my father always stressed on the fact that family is important. Mm. Yeah. And also not just family in relation just to blood. Because when my father was growing up, he's a civil engineer. So he used to travel a lot, working on like roads, bridges around. And he's always developed like very strong ties and relationship with people and through that he's developed a relationship beyond blood so in a sense that um he has friends that he made when he was young and through that he raised their kids and their kids became my siblings that you grew up with and sometimes when you're with them and you're describing yourself oh my brother and they always people always ask you but you said uh you have uh maybe 10 biological like nine biological so how did and i said yeah. no it doesn't it's more complicated you yeah. know uh, life is not as simple as we mm. make it seem to be. And I th guess when you live in a family where there are multiple mothers, you also have to learn to negotiate. Yeah, in mm. between spaces, in between decisions and forms. And that really helps you in a way to be, yeah, I think a bit more matured. Okay. Yeah. Well, if you're just joining in, um, spending time with Ibrahim Mahama, who's a contemporary artist. Uh, we're live on Facebook. And I think uh, Selwyn and the team are showing some pictures of his works, some videos of the Red Clay Studios. You get to see the five airplanes that are parked at the Red Clay Studios uh, that he's turned into classrooms to inspire a whole community. But growing up, Ibrahim, was there a certain profession that you would say you wanted to do? You know, well, younger, they would ask you, what do you want to be when you grow up? Yeah, I there were two things I wanted to be either a pilot or an architect. <laughs> oh, that makes sense. <laughs> either one of them. <laughs> so, uh, in my most failed states, I always say of becoming an artist. <laughs> I thought, you know, maybe now I could chip in that. Yeah, you know. But but at what point did the love for the art itself come in? I've always loved art. Honestly, since I was a child, I wanted to be an art, um, to make art ever since I was little. Because when I was in boarding school, 
one of the things that really kept me going in boarding school was making art. I used to draw a lot. You used to draw a okay. lot, a lot. My may his soul rest in peace. I had a very good friend, Baki Adamu, when we were uh, growing up in St. John's. We always used to sit together. Mm. And uh, yeah, he died a couple of years ago. But I remember when he met my ex girlfriend some years ago, he told her, Oh, uh, Ibrahim, he always, like, he always drew so much when we were kids. And I forgot a lot of these memories. Like, yeah. he was describing some of the uh, cartoons I made back in those days. Mm. But. <coughs> I guess th the desire was always there, mm. but I didn't really think that I would be an artist because when you're growing up as a child, like no one ever thinks, so oh, I want to be an artist, yeah. honestly, until you get to a certain point in your life and you realize that, oh, maybe it's not such a bad idea to try this. Yeah. yeah. I don't know about now, but a few years or some years mm. back when, when uh, a student said we're going to do visual arts, it sort of had a certain connotation to it. It sort of was like the course reserved for people who don't want to do serious professional being a serious profession i mean w yeah. w do, does that make sense yeah it makes sense it's still the same it hasn't it's, changed. it's still the same yeah it hasn't changed much it's also because of the curriculum and the way that art is conceived yeah. to begin with because even in U the knust so for instance when you apply to the university you apply for a certain number of courses yeah and then <coughs> one might say you apply for publishing, blah, blah, blah. And at the end of the day, if you don't meet the grades, they just put you in the fine arts yeah. program. Yeah. That's not how it's supposed to be. In uh, around the world, if you're going to the art school, you just don't stumble into it. You apply yeah. for it. Then they invite you for an interview. You bring your portfolio. They ask you, what are you interested in as an artist? Because mm. it's not every artist that is interested in the same thing. Mm. An artist might be interested in using engineering as a means of making art. One artist might be interested in using poetry. Mm. One might be interested in using, let's say, painting. Yeah. So they want to know where your interest is. So they decide whether they want to admit you. And if they admit you, how can they help you to become a better part of what you want to become? Yeah. But here, they are like, oh, just go to the art uh, place. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I can relate because I also went to KNUST. Okay. And you know, in the social, I did social mm -hmm. sciences. There's social science yeah. on... Can you see campus was yeah. called social so? Yeah, they would. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a slogan that yes. they gave us. Yeah, yes. they would. Like, yes. social science students were just on the campus to yes. sleep. Yes. You know, and, 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 and it was probably worse for visual artists. Yes. You know what I mean? <laughs> I remember my father always used to say, my father always says that, <laughs> oh, when we're in school, that's the, vis the arts guys, they were rascals. <laughs> They're always walking around the campus, not wearing shirts. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. The fact that maybe they are not wearing shirt doesn't mean that they are misfits or outfits. Yeah. Sometimes maybe um, um, artists, we we are labeled that way because in order to be an artist, sometimes you have to be extraordinary. Extra, yeah. You have to be yeah, a bit extra. You have to be, you don't have to conform to yeah. society because that's why not everyone is an artist because the moment you start conforming to society you are no longer an artist yeah the reason why someone is an artist is because he stepped outside the zone of being an ordinary person or thinker and i gotta be honest you represent hope for a lot of visual artists yeah. uh, with what you have accomplished and uh, any young person who's looking at pursuing visual arts did you see you as an icon and and and, and pursue it with, with with their whole hearts that's the point if not, I don't think I would have made a much greater effort to mm. stay back here in Ghana to do all this work. And it's also because there's a big community around it. So, for instance, when you come to Kumasi, we have the Black Star Lines, which is a collective made up of like um, teachers, students alike, who've studied at Cairn University, <coughs> who've decided to stay to teach, to mentor young students, mm. to share ideas. And at the end of the day, you realize that, oh, if uh, there is a, an entire group of people who actually believe that the change is possible within a given time, and who are you not to actually contribute your quota, actually, to this? All right. Uh, like I said earlier, you can get on our Facebook Live uh, feed uh, and check out Ibrahim and some of his works. We're sharing some of them on the Facebook Live feed as well, um, videos and pictures of his works. Okay. So you're done with KNUST. Uh, you've done your master's, then what next? <laughs> then PhD. <laughs> then, then, then PhD, <laughs> yeah. which you're not done with. I'm not done with, yeah, because I've been um, 
traveling and working quite a lot. Okay. And some of the projects I've been working on, like uh, intervening within these the institutions, like yeah. buying the silo in Tamale and converting it yeah. into a cultural institution, it's all part of the PhD research I'm doing. Oh, are you serious? Yeah. yeah. Because, um, yeah, as an artist, you ask yourself, um, what can you contribute to art? Mm. Yeah. And it's not as if the work that we're doing is so common that it's not like every artist in the world is mm. uh, buying up silos or building institutions or things like that. But there is a possibility, actually, to use the conditions that we come from. I think most times what people get wrong is that when you find yourself in a situation, so for instance, coming from Ghana and mm -hmm. knowing all the problems that exist. I remember yesterday when I came back and I got to the airport, <coughs> I said to myself, sometimes you imagine that when you travel and you come back, situation would have changed or be better <laughs> but you come back and it's actually worse because i get back to the airport and immediately the lights goes off at the airport <laughs> and i'm like what are we still living in this age but actually yeah. that's what our condition is yeah of course i know like beyond like uh i wouldn't go into the political aspect of it but if um whatever condition you find yourself in i've always said that if you can actually use the condition as um yeah as a stepping stone mm. actually to see what you can do beyond it it's like uh the condition becomes capital in itself, in okay. a way. And, uh, yeah, I thought that, um, why not? Yeah. So, after school, what was your first commercial piece? Well, in um, 2014, yeah, I there was a work that I sold to uh, an institution in London. Uh, it's called the Saatchi Gallery. It's like one of the biggest art institutions in the world in the late in the early 90s they really contributed to like the global shift in contemporary art and particularly british art so the owner of the place is called charles sachi mm. yeah so yeah he's very known for making artists careers and things like that so he invited me to contribute this work to a very big exhibition they were doing at the time called pangea mm -hmm. which was looking at art from africa and uh south america and i contributed a work to the exhibition the money that I earned from it was the seed capital that I started building these institutions in Tamale with at the time. And um, yeah, from that exhibition, that was it. How much money was it? At the time, hmm, let me see if I do remember correctly. I think it was around 20,000 pounds at the time. 20,000 yeah, pounds. pounds? I remember at the time. Okay. It wasn't, yeah, it yet at the time. That must have been a lot of money for you. It was a lot of money. C from not having any money to having that, it was a lot of money. So that's how come I invested the money into building the institution, into red clay, uh, mm. buying land, yeah. and also uh, starting a SCCA at the time. Yeah, that was yeah, that was that was it at the time. Yeah, it was a big deal for me. Yeah. Yeah. What's uh, I think one of one of the most iconic things that. I mean, I, 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 f following you, I, 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 I pieced together was the, the work you did with the jute sacks yes. that we used to bag charcoal. charcoal. Yeah. And you, what, stitch them together? Yes. <coughs> and you drip a whole building mm -hmm. with it. Yeah. I, I want you to explain the concept of that art piece. Yeah. So that's, um, I was working with the jute sacks earlier. Um, in 2011 when I was doing my MFA but on one during one Christmas I decided I was going to travel to Burkina Faso just casually to visit a friend that's what most young people don't do these days travel mm -hmm. so casually I just bought ticket STC got on a bus to Burkina Faso and we got to uh, the uh, Paga the border the border and yeah. we're stuck there for a really long time mm. you know and the all these uh, onion trucks were crossing and they were c the onions were bagged in this jute sack yeah and i was i kept sewing i kept seeing it again and again the image of it and i was like this looks really interesting as a political material in terms of what it represents so maybe later on i should look at it so when i went to burkina and came back later on i was researching more into it and i realized that the jute sacks were actually materials that were imported for the transportation of cocoa mm -hmm. Because in knowing the 60s, when Kwame Krumah was building the silos, he was building the silos so we could store cocoa and process in Ghana. Yeah. But after the overthrow, most of these w buildings were abandoned. So if you go to Cocoa Processing Company in Tama, CPC, you find these huge infrastructure just existing. And myself, when I was uh, 16, I bought some shares at uh, CPC at the time, casually, with a friend, <laughs> because he was doing business in Presec, and he told me, oh, 
let's go and buy shares at C, uh, CPC. Mm. And so I connected it back to the, that time because there was a certain glimpse of hope in the company in terms of like what this represented, yeah. particularly given in Krumah's uh, idea back in those days. So I uh, did a couple of travels within that period and I met some artists who were also using the material. When I came back home, I realized that the heart of the material was actually the ones that have been used to transport charcoal. The thing that people don't understand about art is that sometimes people would say to me, but why don't you use the new ones? <laughs> but the new one doesn't have character. Mm. It doesn't have life. But that's the paradox. Someone might say, oh, but the jute sack that you're using to carry charcoal, it is torn and uh, it looks like it's discarded. And I said, yes, that's when it has life. Actually, when it's dead. Because at the point of death, when the women have taken, like when they bring, when they put the charcoal in it, and then they have to cut through part of it. Then they, sometimes they take their cloth, part of their cloth to stitch it. Mm -hmm. They use part of tree bags in the villages to stitch it. The material really comes to life. When you see the body, when you see the surface, it looks like a human body which has scars on it. Mm. So I thought that it could be really be interesting to somehow create uh, a relationship between this material and architecture and the history of architecture. Because suddenly you can be able to make a connection between uh, a, a fabric and a building yeah. in terms of the labor factor that yeah. goes into it because when you look at something you normally don't look at the labor if you go to the market to go and buy tomatoes or whatever we don't think about how the tomatoes actually gets there we just want to consume it and that's what human beings are we just consume and consume and consume without taking a moment to reflect but if suddenly you woke up one day and you saw like the national theater which we did we covered the entire building with the jute sacks if you saw it, they, it's it's almost like a provocation. Be like, ah, but why would someone actually yeah. sit down to stitch 50,000 bags together to cover the National Theatre? Then you begin to ask yourself questions regarding where these materials are coming from, the labor that goes into it and all that. Wow. Yeah. What an amazing idea. Yeah. And it did make you some money. Yes. So uh, a lot of those projects that I did, uh, like uh, buying, the, um, making these works, I also made other versions of it, which were more like uh, typical paintings. Or, like I said, paintings, I call them that, but they are like small installations, yeah. which institutions, museums buy. And some of these works are what actually have funded all these projects I've been yeah. talking about, buying the... And isn't it interesting that this jute sack, which <laughs> was uh, brought in to carry cocoa, which at the time when it's carrying cocoa, the cocoa per bag it's more valuable than the jute sack yeah now the cocoa has left the shores of ghana and the bag remains and then it's used for charcoal and then it's discarded and as an artist i collect this material and i use it to make an artwork and now the artwork is far more valuable than a container of cocoa. The, the cocoa and then you use the same money to go back and then talk to the the, where the building which was abandoned say can i buy the building from you and then convert it into a cultural institution it's actually it's revolutionary to think about it in that yeah. way because it almost gives us the ability to time travel to go back into time yeah. Yeah. to 1966 and say that look uh, let's go back into that time when all these ideas were mm. halted and now with a collective uh, memory of history now we know what has happened in time yeah we, from 66 to now we all have the memory of it mm. so now we're saying okay let's not we don't of course we don't want to use the building we c you can't contain you can't put cocoa into the building now okay, of course yes, yeah. but now what can you put into it collective memory and ideas and that is worth more than anything and that is what actually the continent has been lacking all these all these decades yeah yeah jifa goma she is listening she says oh i'm listening to you and ibrahim how refreshing I'm happy. You can also send in your WhatsApp message to us on 055-1111-997. When I shared the artwork of our conversation, one of my good friends, Jonathan Adams, the managing editor of 24 News, said, I should ask you, you've been able to sell an artwork for $1 million. Uh, <laughs> how did you do that? <laughs> it's not a single work. You know, sometimes when it's uh, <laughs> when people are reporting on these things. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a bit of so excitement. it wasn't a single. It wasn't a single for a artwork. Dollars, but yeah, it was a couple of artworks because some of the projects I produce, mm. like some of the bigger installations. So um, there are a lot of different works I've done. Like uh, I did a work called "Non Erasable in Cancer" mm. some years ago, and it was basically shoemaker boxes, which mm -hmm. I was going around a crowd collecting from people, from the shoemaker boys, and I was mostly interested in the character of the box. Because when box are, when the boys are passing by with the boxes and you look at them, you just look at some guy with a box. No, but when you look at the box really well, 
you realize that the box actually looks like a house. Mm. The shape of it yes, and all that. Yes. And they make these boxes out of discarded parts of kiosks and buildings around the city. So I was really interested in the story of the box and the character and the history of it. So I extended that work by going to Tema. There were some old um, um, factories that were being going, going to be demolished. Mm -hmm. And then I actually um, negotiated with the people who were going to demolish the place. And I took some of the inside content, like ex wood and other things. And I made a work out of it. I extended. So mm -hmm. uh, there were two of those, those, three of those pieces. There was one which was shown in um, uh, Ukraine. And there was one which was shown in um, um, where, in London, and later on it went to Miami. So if you combine all those three pieces, that was a total value of like a million plus. Like a million, okay. Yeah, but it was just a single artwork. Yeah. So if you sell those three artworks, of course, as an artist, like a footballer, when you sell a work, you don't get all the money. Mm. You get a commission, a fifty percent. Okay. So if by the time you sell a work for a million, you're only getting five hundred thousand. Yeah. By the time you sell a work for a hundred thousand, you're only getting fifty thousand. Yeah. So imagine you made a series of different works, maybe yeah. hundred thousand, fifty thousand, and then maybe it came together. It really adds up at yes. the end of the day to yeah. be able to realize an yes. idea. And you can replicate these artworks in different uh, installations as well. Yes. And make more money off it. Yeah, more. But it's for me, it's never really been about the making of money. Yeah. It's always been about the idea of building something which didn't exist before. Mm. That somehow shifts the consciousness of an entire generation. Yes. So, for instance, the real reason why I was building the institutions in Tamale was actually to save my, the legacy of my work mm -hmm. and the ideas that I'm working with. So all these works that I'm talking about, you go to museums around the world and you go to their national collections and these museums, uh, these works are there. Like the shoemaker box is not a rentable. There's one, so there are th uh, three of them. One is in London, one is in uh, Van, uh, uh, Ottawa in uh, Canada, in their, Canada. National, in their national museum, the collection. The country bought it. Wow. The whole country, they bought the work for genera future generations, what represents art within the time. They bought it and kept it there. There was also one in Miami in a museum which they bought and put there together with what they consider some of the best works that have existed within the period. But when you come down to Ghana, you're talking to maybe, let's say, cultural ministry or something. They, 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 no they one will take you it. serious. Like, are you serious? Like, what? Are, this this doesn't mean anything, you know? Yeah. So it's the, consci the, the, the consciousness has to shift. Mm. That's the problem with the time that we live in, that we have enough people enough people that live in res uh, who occupy responsible positions who actually don't know the significance of what is being done mm. within that given time so as an artist if you're able to build an institution that saves that work so i always save the best part of the works here in ghana so uh, all the works that i've saved here if you're thinking about with the net worth in terms of the value that it represents even within this time it's running into the several millions but you're not thinking about it just within this generation. You're thinking about it. What would this work represent in the next 20, 30 years? So I'm, I'm tempted to ask, what makes a great art piece? <laughs> <laughs> There's so many things. There's so many things. Yeah. One, it might be with regards to the form, in terms of the shape, what yeah. it is. Secondly, how it was made. Third, maybe the story behind it, mm. concept, whatever. And sometimes it's also just in terms of the time, the time that it's made in, yeah. the sensitivity. Okay. Yeah. So, for instance, there are a lot of the work that I make, sometimes people think that maybe it's too intellectual or something like that. But it's yeah. not about intellect or anything. It's constantly trying to push the narrative of art and the form of art. Yeah. If my predecessors were making artworks that were based on me coming to, let's say, um, Agbubuloshi or whatever, and taking inspiration, taking photographs of women, going to my studio, making paintings, and then hanging it in a gallery. And suddenly you say to yourself, oh no, I want to make a work that is actually a shift from what it was before. Maybe this work this time will take the form of, let's say, uh, a building or mm. something like that. Mm. It's a very significant shift. And sometimes when the shift happens within it, that's where the significance of art lies. Like some people sometimes would say, oh, but they see a, a, an auction and there's a work of Picasso. And they're like, ah, but this thing, my child can do it. Yeah. No, your child cannot do it. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what Picasso went through in order to make that. There was a shift that happened 
in Picasso in terms of the way he was thinking. Mm -hmm. And ordinarily, as a human being, you wouldn't think that way. Yeah. Because the moment you want to start thinking that way, there is this, always this subconscious part of you that says, no, stop it. Like, uh, this is too childish. It's too childlike. And actually, when you explore children, that's when the brain forms the most. When children grow up thinking, having imagination and all that, there are things that they can realize in their society that ordinarily they wouldn't be able to realize if their imagination is already stalled. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, see, I've seen so many great exhibitions. Currently, there's one happening at Nubuki Fo yes. Foundation yes. in East Legon. Yeah. I don't know whether you've seen it. Okay. Lois and I Teresa and Kuma, Teresa. they're yeah. exhibiting uh, there. I've seen Teresa's moment, the memories of the present, mm -hmm aura of life, mm -hmm. a walk through intimacy, mm -hmm. and they're amazing. Mm -hmm. There are many great artists like Teresa Ankoma and Lois and all of that, and, and I'm sure some of them are listening to you, hoping to reach the heights that you've reached. What pointers will you give these artists? Well, uh, these are colleagues. They are people that I've um, seen grow, because some of them were my... Um, when I was doing my MFA, they were doing their undergrad in tech, so I've encountered them many times. And I guess we're all trying to do the same thing. I mostly, I don't ap like to approach younger artists from the point of uh, a teacher. It's more like a mentor in terms of, let's say, uh, having conversation with them mm. and trying to give them, let's say, little guides in terms of, um, yeah, attitudes, uh, the attitude towards, um, yeah, reservation, things mm. like that. Uh, the problem on the continent and let's let's even use Ghana is that sometimes people think that they're too hungry yeah they're like oh but I need to eat no but at the end of the day how much can you eat you need to be patient because sometimes you create something and that thing that you create there is so much value to it but at the time when you make it no one really knows it because as an artist you always have to remember that you are making work you are making art because you are trying to produce ideas which do not exist yet. Mm. So the society will struggle to understand it. Of course, sometimes some artists make really crappy work and they should be banned from making <laughs> art, I always say, like music. <laughs> you know. But when you make good work, you know that you've made good work. Yeah. And you just have to be a little patient. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes you need the right person to come along. And sometimes it could take a long time. It could take 10 years, 20 years. That's why sometimes you see that, oh, this, an artist is dead and they've discovered his work. Because at the time when he was alive, no one actually mm -hmm. knew, no, no one could get into the right frame of mind. But luckily enough, within our generation, we have examples. Yeah. Like when we were in school, it was very hard to find ex examples of artists who you could think about. Oh, he's Ghanaian. He's been here. He's done this amount of work internationally. He's done this. Of course, there are examples like El, Rose Wanko, like there are several artists. But to talk about young artists who are living within a time mm -hmm. and who have the ability to contribute towards a shift in the narrative, it was almost um, little, mm. you know. So now we're thinking in our generation, how collectively, how can we come together to be able to do things? So I think that if uh, younger artists are listening, they should, or practitioners, I mostly just don't like to talk to artists, but it could be engineers or farmers or whatever, they should think about forming collectives, okay. like coming together to yeah. support each other. Okay. This, uh, the system has somehow mm -hmm. taught us to think that we are in competition with one another. We are not in competition with that one another. We actually need to build a society collectively. So if I have an idea or if I have something that I think might benefit someone, sometimes I travel, and there's a book I see on an artist's work. And I say, oh, this thing might benefit this uh, artist of mine. Then you buy the book and you come and give it to the person. If that person grows, automatically it will affect you. Mm. Yeah. Good stuff. Lots of messages coming in. I think people are loving the conversation this yeah. evening. Uh, if you're on Facebook, you can put your comments in our Facebook live feed as well. And I, I read some of them. Imet Inoyibi says, many of us have wasted our years. We always thought the arts were for, in quotes, not too good in class. <laughs> Very refreshing listening to Ibrahim. Really proud of him. Thank you so much. And um, uh, let me see. Lexus, did he say he was a student at Star Avenue? Uh, if so, what years? Since my children went to that school, I followed Ibrahim's work and He's a great guy, not just an artist, but looks like a philosopher, an inventor, and an innovator. <laughs> it's from Reverend Albert Seth Okran, Spintex Road. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I also got a message from my brother, Michael Nemo, who says, Lexus, way back in school, Ibrahim has always been an intelligent boy. We, the Pujo Bess, are proud of him. Uh, as you keep pushing, 
please ask him if he would like to build a visual arts block in PJ to be named <laughs> after him. <laughs> 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 okay. Uh, so, uh, Pamela says, I'm listening to the show, but I can't. Is that Ibrahim Mahama, ex-president Mahama's brother? <laughs> <laughs> no, we said that in the beginning of the show. Probably you joined in late, but no, that's not the brother of ex-president Mahama. This is Ibrahim Mahama, the artist and the author. Yeah. Now, Ibrahim, it's it's not been all smooth, has it? No. Um, you had to deal with a famous lawsuit. Yes. I and uh, against some dealers, Stefan. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Jonathan Ellis King. Yes. yes. I, I understand it's settled now, yes, yes. but I want to understand exactly what the issue was. <laughs> Is this something you can share? Yes. Yes, okay. certainly. So this was very early on in my practice. So I was uh, finishing school and I got contacted by this uh, young guy, Ellis King, who wanted to, um, <coughs> yeah, he wanted to show my work, but he wanted to buy a piece of it in mm. the beginning. So I sold a piece of the work actually to him um years um like a few years later there was uh, a, a dispute regarding the form of the work because the work had been mutilated uh so for instance if you're an artist and you sell a work in original form and then later on the work changes do you just allow the work to go on as it is imagine you're a musician and then you've made work and then the music is somehow somebody remixes, remixes the music, the music <laughs> things yeah. like that so I uh, was like, oh no, this doesn't represent my work. But I was actually very young at the time because um, just coming out from art school, anything can destroy you, you know. So uh, when I said I wasn't going to take that, the uh, lawsuit followed that because as an artist, young artist from here, couldn't, obviously you cannot fight it. Yeah. There's always is the tactics that people use. Okay. Like, oh, if we serve him a lawsuit, he will just leave us alone. Cause okay. You know that, and the lawsuit, had to, it came from California. Wow. Yeah, so I was like, mm, okay, I have to decide in between the long term of my work, my practice, or fight this thing on and lose whatever I can lose. So I fought it on. So I went through, and I lost quite a lot within the period because at the time I spent over $150,000 in legal fees. Wow. In, yeah, in paying a lawyer. I never, it's not something I ever spoke to my family about because I didn't think they could help in any way. Mm -hmm. because they didn't even they wouldn't have even understood the complication and because someone would say oh but if someone has taken your work and then cut yeah. it into pieces it doesn't matter no but it mattered to me yeah so i had to fo fight it on and it took like uh and the guy they had a lot of money of course they were paying all kinds of journalists to write all kinds of articles internationally and all that and i had also there were very important art exhibitions that i was invited to but at the time most of those invitations were withdrawn because those big institutions didn't want to be associated with scandals. Okay. So when I fought it on till the end, and I finally, one time I took, um, I had a gallery in Italy that was helping me with it. So I flew to LA and I went f t to settle the dispute, one of the last moments of it. So when I got there and everything was resolved and uh, yeah, they had to return the works to what it was, blah, blah, blah. And then there was, a there was an article that was published online. Everything was suddenly restored. Wow. And this was in 2016. And in 2016, after, um, the, the, in the thing you read, there was an exhibition called Documenta. Okay, yeah. So Documenta is most like the Olympics in the art world in terms of what we do. Yeah. And every artist dreams to be in it. Mm -hmm. If not when he's old, but when he's dead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but <laughs> I was just 20 something when that was happening. Mm -hmm. And I, was had, I had been invited to it. So that was a really big deal. And this is what a student's we're all looking up to yeah. like oh but no one ever thought that you get to it so for me that was really important in order to have escaped that yeah and to have my practice to this date it was a real miracle we thank god for that yeah what would you like to be remembered for i don't know my pff, i guess it's uh, more or less uh your yeah your contribution to the development of others yeah mm. for me it's very important it's more important than anything in this world I guess there's no point if you're successful and whatever success you have doesn't reflect on the society that you find yourself in. It's totally useless if whatever you do doesn't reflect within the society that you live in. Sometimes I see that people get really gullible. Like pe People make little money. They want to show off. They buy big cars or have a Rolls Royce or whatever. It doesn't mean anything. At the end of the day, if you die, you're dead. 
Yeah, it doesn't mean anything. But imagine if you are able to rebuild, like you're able to build a society that can actually allow for not just your children, but for other children to have the same opportunities as you have. It even makes your children a lot more better because there is something that, you know, when yeah. your children are living in a society where you're giving them all the opportunities, they feel like they're good. Yeah. But until they go somewhere else and they realize that, no, they're shit. Yeah. So for me, it's more important to be able to invest in society as a general <laughs> so your children can actually have... They can actually, when they are engaging yeah. with the society, it makes them much better people. Yeah. You know, you re actually really yeah. said that artists, you can't control them. Yeah. Because <laughs> my artist here just used a word that I need to apologize for. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. But when they're in their elements, <laughs> you've got to understand them. I'm, I'm grateful. Um, and I'm sure that the listener understands. Please mm -hmm. pardon us for that one. Uh, but Ibrahim, um, I'm so happy you came on the show today. Um, I've enjoyed your company and God bless you. Grace Thompson just sent a message. Kudos and thanks to Ibrahim for his contribution to helping young artists in Ghana. So Ghana appreciates you and we hope to see a lot more of your works and the success and probably transforming Savannah like you've already started. God bless you so much. Yeah. Thank you. And and we should plan a trip up north. I'd want to come to the Red Clay Studios. Yes, please. It is it is, an is that open? Yeah. yeah, it's open. Okay. It's let's, open let's to everyone and it's yeah. uh, our, um, yeah, our services are free. Yeah. Anyone can come there at any time. Oh, it's with their free. Family. Yeah, it's free. It's wow. None, yeah. All the programs we do are free. So, um, yeah, it's open and people should just feel free. To God bless you anytime. so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm Lexus Bill. I've enjoyed conversing with one of Ghana's finest contemporary artists, Ibrahim Mahama, on Personality Profile. The, the video is on Facebook. You can catch up again uh, if you missed any part of the conversation. Go willing tomorrow. We're back on your radio. Let's find out what's happening in news. My MAC is standing by now. Thank you, Lexus. And that's the headline news at 8. Some farmers are predicting there may be a looming food crisis as the impact of a prolonged drought in some parts of the country. They say the situation may result in the stifled water supply for some food crops in the southern sector. The Peasant Farmers Association is worried that this would affect the supply of farm produce to the market. Charles Nyaba is head of programs and advocacy at Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana. When you go to the transitional zone and the southern zone, that's where we have serious problems, especially crops like uh, maize. Many farmers, more than 50%, couldn't actually uh, uh, plant. They also plant their crops uh, well fed. So uh, that, 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 that. That is how bad it is uh, in those days. But you realize that in recent years, we have a greater chunk of our areas coming from the northern part of the country. If you take maize, for instance, we have greater quantities of maize coming from the southern east and west, from the northern region, and then from Bolu A. Meanwhile, the price of maize has been soaring in Tichman and other major markets in the country. A 130 kilogram sack of maize has now moved from 230 cities to 370 cities. Aubrey Yabwa is the secretary for Tichman Maize Buyers Association.